everyone. I'm so happy to be here. This is uh, um, a new experience for us. We're running our own AV, and Michael's done a great job putting together lights, action, camera, sound, and all that. And it's, uh, it feels like the first day of school for some reason. We've been away and apart for so long, but it's great to be touching base with all of you. I thought I'd update you and tell you what I did on my summer vacation. Um, it started with Michael coming in and telling me that although all the regulators and everyone agrees that I had passed the registered investment advisor test, a very gruesome one, back in 1996, they all said it was in the wrong place and it couldn't be moved and they could see it, but bottom line, I had to take the test again. And then a week after that, I fell into a garbage pit disposing of a refrigerator on a recycling place and got to have staples for the first time in my life. And then I got to have COVID for three weeks. And then when I could breathe again, I went fishing with my son, Andrew, who caught a 17 pound pike, who shredded my, my finger and it got infected. So I'm looking forward to actually going back to 2020 almost. So things can only turn up from here. Let's get rid of the disclaimers. What if I told you at the beginning of the year that the year would start with extreme political polarization, so much so that there was a riot in Washington on the January 6th, that the pandemic would be raging and everything would be shut down again, we'd have variants and restrictions, that we'd have spiraling deficits to combat that and debt to combat all the damage the uh, pandemic was doing, that we would have labor shortages where we couldn't even get workers and restaurants would close only be open Thursday, Friday, Saturday because they couldn't get workers. And we had supply chain disruptions where you couldn't get a truck if you tried to order it. And of course, we have inflation fears and interest rate uh, rise, uh, the thought of an interest rate rise. And everybody's talking about the Fed tapering and how much money's in the system. And then even last week, China raised its head again this week. So, you know, what if I said, what would this market look like? Well, certainly not what we got with the Dow, and all these numbers are through Labor Day, up 15.6%, the NASDAQ up 19, the S&P 500 almost 21, small caps even doing well, 16%. I want you to notice that the developed international is pretty good at about a little bit less than 10%, and the emerging markets just, just treading water. And the big one is interest rates are up this year. So the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index is down for the year. But really, with what we've experienced, we're, we are extremely fortunate, I think, to be where we are. And that brings me to my point that, you know, I think valuations appear a little bit stretched right now. When we measure how expensive a stock, uh, a stock is, we talk about P-E ratio. What's its price relative to its earnings? How many years of earnings do we have to get at this level to earn it back? So right now, the Dow is 24 times trailing earnings. Typically, that is 15 times. 15 is pretty normal, except when we have extremely low interest rates like we do now, then the typical average is 19 when the 10-year treasury is below 3%. So we are overvalued. We appear stretched, especially when it comes to the S&P 500 and even more so the NASDAQ. And the point I'd like to make about this is if you look at the forward P.E. ratio, even what's projected to happen in the future looks a little bit stretched. So if the next year comes true for the analyst expectations on earnings, we still look a little bit stretched. And it's not just stocks. If you look at the high yield bonds, there's a note I have on the slide. 85% of high yield bonds as of September 6th had negative real yields. It means that they weren't even earning the rate of inflation. So they're very, very high priced. And it feels to me a lot like 1999. Let me take you back to 1999. Do you remember the guy Henry Blodgett on there talking about clicks and eyeballs? Yep, Amazon's worth this because they have clicks, they have eyeballs, stamps.com, pets.com. And everybody was just piling in and little kids that were 19 years old were you know, driving Ferraris because they understood this stuff and were just piling money into it. We all know how that ended. I'll tell you what, it feels a lot like 1999 right now because now, guess what? Henry Blodgett's back on TV. He's been barred from the industry, but now he's talking about cryptocurrencies and total addressable markets on certain stocks. And let's look at some of these. Palantir Technologies, 
a cloud company. Its market cap is $51 billion. That's the value of all its stock added together. Its sales are 1.3 billion. Remember I just told you we value companies on PE ratios? Well, now we're stretching it to price to sales. You would need 39 years worth of current sales to earn back a share of stock. And they have no profit. Zoom Video, right? The hero of the downturn? Well, Zoom has got a market cap of $88 billion, sales of 3.6, it's selling at 25 times sales or 90 times earnings. Shopify, almost a $200 billion company, 3.9 billion in sales. That's 51 times sales, 80 times earnings. Does that sound familiar? This is what we were talking about in 1999. And I don't think anything demonstrates the difference between old world and new world right now better than Tesla. Let's talk about General Motors for a minute, that stodgy old company, the one you really can't get a truck from right now because they don't have chips. Their market cap is $71 billion. They have sales of $136 billion. So if you do the math, they're selling at one half time sales. Oh, and by the way, they're the consummate value company, and Ken's gonna explain that a lot more in his talk, but they have a profit of $12.5 billion, which means they're selling at 5.6 times earnings. That is a value company, that's a real company. Not that Tesla's not a real company or not a great car, but they've been assigned a market cap of three quarters of a trillion dollars. Think about that. That's more than every other car company on earth added together their market cap. That's crazy. They're selling at 20 times sales and 380 times profits. And I gotta remind you, those profits are a lot of credits they sell to other companies that have been given by the government. The effect of these stretched valuations is this. And I love this quote from a very famous hedge fund manager, Jeremy Grantham. It's one that Ken and I follow. He's, he's a great guy. The one reality that you can never change is that a higher priced asset will produce a lower return than a lower priced asset. It's just common sense, folks. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can enjoy it now, or you can enjoy it steadily in the distant future, but not both. And the price we pay right now for having this market go higher and higher is a lower 10-year return from the peak. So to me, when I read that and I follow Jeremy Grantham, is he right that we're at a peak? Well, I've got a question mark, but let's talk about the last 12 and a half years. Are we at a peak? We're only a couple percent off all-time highs today. The Dow Jones has gone up fourfold. The S&P 500 nearly sixfold. You've made 11 times your money in the NASDAQ in the last 12 and a half years. Now, to be fair, we were coming off one of the worst crises ever. Let me take you back and remind you that you all lived through this. But starting October 9th of 2007, that was the high of the market. Then the financial crisis hit. By March 9th of 2009, the Dow had dropped 54% and you had lost 57% in the S&P 500. The Fed was scrambling, wondering what to do, making all the big banks kick in money to save the system. And actually for a few days, bonds were cut in half because the trading systems failed. It was it had locked up. So the bottom line is from that low, we have had an amazing run. And why? A lot the Federal Reserve and all this money that they've done to flood the system. So if we think stocks are stretched and maybe near a peak, what about bonds? I can say, I know bonds are at a peak, all right? How do I know that? Well, 40 years ago today, if we were meeting, the 10-year treasury would be at 15.82%. Remember the bond teeter-totter. When rates drop, bond prices go up. What did, what did, what did prices do when we dropped from 15.82% all the way down to 1.32 on September 6, 142 yesterday. Of course, interest rates are banging on the ground. Bond prices can't go higher. You're never gonna get in bonds what you got the last 40 years. I hope you enjoyed it. But so Jeremy Grantham's right about bonds and we have a reasonable belief he's somewhat right about or close to a peak in stocks. And what does that, 
What does that do for you? Well, what I have here on this slide, and it's a very important slide, this is what the returns have been from 2006 to 2020. As I just showed you, this is backloaded towards the last 10 years, okay? But on average, the first line, U.S. stocks, big caps, have done 9.9%. And that's pretty much what we always say, right? 8 to 10% in stocks. But that's what you've got the last 15 years. The last 10 years, you've gotten more than that. And what do we expect? The more important part is, what do we expect from every asset class going forward based on the last 10 to 15 years? And I'm telling you that Mr. Grantham's right. We're setting up for below average returns. I'm not saying negative, but I'm saying maybe not 8 to 10%, but maybe six to 8%. You've got to figure that you are going to get below average returns for the next you know, decade in large cap US stocks, small cap US stocks, certainly high yield bonds, probably real estate. Internationals did not run up as much as you see. And, and the thought process is that uh, emerging markets will do better in the next 10 years. Internationals will do average. Fixed income just went over that, right? That's going to be way below average, cash should be average, and commodities who have had 15 years of negative returns here are probably going to be above average. And that makes sense when we start talking about inflation and that sort of thing. So if we think it's going to be below average, why wouldn't you? I'm just going to ask the question for you because I'm going to get asked it a lot. Let's just get out of the market. Let's turn and run. Why wouldn't we do that? Well, like I've said for the last 30 years up here, because the bucket approach works. And I'm telling you this, I'll look you right in the eye right now and tell you that if we knew a 15% correction was gonna happen this next week, we wouldn't change a thing because we couldn't possibly know when to get back in and you have to stay invested. And we have enough relative stability to weather a couple market cycles, all right? And that's what you have to do. We've proven it. Safety is relative, is my second point. And often, you know, it's an illusion. And exhibit A on that is Europe. Think of the Europeans who fled to the safety of banks when the turmoil started with Brexit and all that and found themselves dealing with negative interest rates on their deposit. Let me say it a different way. Being charged by their bank for holding money. So you have 100,000, next year at negative 1%, you have 99,000. That, don't think that couldn't happen here. We don't expect it to, but it could. All right. Another reason why we wouldn't turn tail and run. None of this wasn't true 25% ago. It was true last fall. It was true in February. All of, these, all of these things about overvaluation was true a while ago. And we don't know when it's going to end. And last but not least, there's a lot of analysts that say it's not going to end. That it's just going to keep going and going because of demographics, because the millennials have a peak wave coming in 2026, and, the, and those waves don't stop until 2038. So there's a lot of reasons why this market, A, could go higher, and B, even if we knew it's going to get the volatility that we always expect, we would ride through it. And so the real ultimate point is it's gonna take a lot more patience, both on our part and your part going forward, a lot of diligence and a real risk controlled approach to navigate the next 10 years. And that's why we monitor what we do. The crux of what we do for you, and Ken's gonna go a lot more into depth on this, but at the investment policy committee level, what we do is we monitor macroeconomic data. And what we're really doing is we're looking for signs of recession. So what points us that way? Well, the unemployment rate, housing starts, industrial production, manufacturing, the money supply, treasury rates, Fed publications, all these kind of things we monitor constantly from a top-down approach. From a bottom-up approach, all right, Ken and the team are also looking at the individual pieces of what we own, and he's gonna explain a lot about that. But in, in conjunction with that, all intertwined are the expense ratios and returns and correlations and information ratios and tracking error and active share, all these important things that tell us, are we getting what we think we're getting when we own investments? And last but not least, 
there's some big calls on market valuation. You know, we use two very, very sound ways of valuing the market, the capital profits model and the Graham and Dodd. And I'm very proud that many years ago we came up with our own way, uh, the proprietary horizon model. And, and so we look at that. Do we make decisions just solely on the data? No. No, there's a lot of qualitative invest of, of uh, anal analysis that goes on. What's our focus? First and foremost, knowing what we own. We know everything that we own. We, and to know what we own, we do that because we want to mitigate the risk and we own quality. But another thing we do is not just about avoiding risk. We scan for opportunities as well. Well, we sometimes find some threats, but we also look for opportunities because in the end, we want to make you money. We want to protect it, but we want to make you money. And so what I'd like to do is talk about our, for just a second, introduce our uh, Horizon Advisory Services Investment Policy Committee. You'll see Ken in a few minutes. You all know Ken who runs it. I serve on that committee as the old guy who's seen these markets before. Brian Novellan is our Director of Trading. We have a new uh, hire, Ben Chappell. He's from the University of Cincinnati, a Bearcat, don't hold that against him, but uh, a young gentleman, a very promising future, very analytical. Not a lot of jokes being told over in that greenhouse because these guys are quiet researchers over there. And then Michael serves on it, and Mike's got an MBA, two finance degrees, uh, and he's also the Chief Compliance Officer of the Policy Committee and the RIA. So together, the five of us, under Ken's direction, manage this money. And I just want to say, A, great job, Ken, and B, I feel that finally we've got the right people, processes, and partners, strategic partners like Orion and TD Ameritrade in place to, to really run a great firm. Now, the one point I want to make is that low return environments are challenging and withdrawal strategy, minimizing taxes, and avoiding mistakes and keeping on top of your situation with regular views are critical in a low, rate, a low return environment. And our talented team of financial advisors shoulder this important work. But the advisement itself, helping people with their situations is not without its challenges right now. First and foremost, we have shifting ground for tax planning. How many tax ideas have you seen floated in the last couple of weeks? In fact, just before I came over here, President Biden was on and, 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 and took us on a real big circle of all these different ideas he'd like to, to, to uh, take care of, including taxing unrealized capital gains. So, you know, this is all shifting right now. The market didn't like that when uh, it was positive when he started speaking. But the fact is, you know, there's gonna be, there is going to be tax change. We've got an assault on accumulated wealth. For us, one of the big challenges is health care and long-term care transitions. You know, I'll tell you very honestly, the bulk of our clients retired between 98 and 2005. And when you start dealing with that age group, health plays a big issue. Long-term care transitions, and unfortunately the next one, facilitating intergenerational wealth transfers. It's better done by gifting, but a lot of time it's done at death. And that leaves us with, and probably the biggest challenge we've had lately, um, is the number of times we've had to provide pretty in-depth education and even financial literacy to children and grandchildren. We love doing it, all right, but, but there's a lot of it happening here at the Horizon Group. Let me go through some of those quickly. Tax reform, I believe, is inev inevitable. Now, we all know what Benjamin Franklin said about death and taxes, all right? But I like the way Will Rogers said it better. The difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress is in session. And that's, that's relatively true. Here are the rumblings right now from Washington. Of course, I wrote this a few weeks ago. It doesn't include what just was on the radio and the TV an hour ago. But I think we're going to get a corporate tax increase. I think it's a fairly done deal. Trump lowered it to 21%. I think it's going to go back to 26.5. They floated 28%. For those people who own businesses, and the bulk of the small businesses in this country are S-corps, 
They're passed through entities. There are a host of issues that are gonna be changed with those and they're not uh, favorable for the business owner. Capital gains is gonna be raised. They're talking to 25% or possibly for very wealthy people treated as ordinary income. There's the elimination of stepped up basis of death. Let me explain that to you. If Uncle Joe bought a stock for a dollar a share, now it's worth $100 a share. Uncle Joe dies and leaves it to you. You pay tax on anything over the $100 it was worth on the date of his death. If they get their way, they may go back to, he leaves it to you, and you pay anything over the dollar that he paid for it. That's what would happen if they eliminated stepped up basis at death. It's very important planning. Of course, the bulk of our money that we manage for you guys is in IRAs. That doesn't happen in IRAs. Every dollar is taxable in an IRA. Speaking of IRAs, there's going to be big Roth changes. The backdoor uh, Roth contribution is being eliminated. There's going to be limits on converting to a Roth. They've been throwing out $450,000 for a married couple. And another thing you're going to see is surcharges for high earners. It looks like uh, none of my clients are at this level, uh, but it's, uh, or neither am I, I don't want to insinuate this, but it's at $5 million, there's going to be a 3% surcharge above all income taxes. Um, and I think that's going to be done. But the things that you will see, they're not tax increases, but they're surcharges. You can see your Medicare premiums go up and the penalties for earning too much money on Medicare going up. And you're going to see a lot of insidious green taxes and usage fees as well. Make no doubt about it. Um, you've probably all seen this dress, all right? I'm not going to make a political comment here, but what I'm going to say is this. I want you to think about that you have a sitting member of Congress going out high profile with a blood red tax the rich dress on. I mean, think about that. This is, this is unprecedented territory. And there's 57 million millionaires worldwide. Think about that, 57 million. We've swelled the ranks here in the United States with this new asset bubble that we've kind of gotten into. And the people who are millionaires are not who you think. What do you picture when I say a millionaire? You picture private jets, boats, that kind of thing, right? No, no, it's, the, it's our clients. I mean, if you were sitting here like tomorrow when we're doing this at, at, at the museum, I'm gonna say, look to your left, look to your right because the vast majority of our clients are millionaires. They don't feel like millionaires. Why? Because they're living off a lump sum of money that's gotta provide income and security for a lifetime. $800,000 taking $45,000 a year is not rich. But if you add in your savings, a couple Roth IRAs, your home paid for, you're exactly who they're talking about all these revenue increases for. And you know what? I wouldn't even mind if they were going to tax the rich. But the rich are skating free. It's the wealthy. It's the upper middle class because that's where all the money is. And, and, and it's you. This is who's being targeted. I want to talk about what we've done at the Horizon Group. I will say this slide is on here because a client, a long, long time client called up and says, I need a meeting with you, Mark. Not other people, I need a meeting with you. I don't understand what's gone on the last five years. There's been so much change. I meet now and there's three people in the room. I need to bring my tax return. You and I used to just talk about stuff. And, and, and I'm gonna say this, there's been, a lot, there's been a lot of change. And I will say it's really all been for the better. Now, some of it has been driven by industry consolidation and regulation changes. But some of it's because we want to make operational improvements. We've upgraded our strategic partners. Like I said, Orion, TD Ameritrade, PCS. There are so many improvements that we've made. I think the biggest one is that we now have our own in-house money management and our own registered investment advisor. I don't know if anybody could appreciate the investment of time and money that that took. You have to be a certain size in this business to make it worthwhile to be your own RIA. And it, and it takes some full-time people. I'll tell you right now, we could not do it if Michael did not leave National Grid and help us, all right? Because there, there's, there's so much to the compliance, to the legal side, to the contracts. Um, there's a lot of ways to go wrong, and he keeps us on the straight and narrow. 
The other thing, why the changes? Because we're developing a deep bench of talented young advisors. Why? For continuity, not for profit. Not, not, not because we, 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 we want to go out and conquer the world. We're doing it because we need it to solidify this firm so we can keep open for decades and guide all these intergenerational wealth transfers. And we change because we want to maintain cutting edge systems and processes. I don't have it with me, but one of the biggest ones, I have my accounts on my phone. You can all have your RIA accounts on your phone at, at, at a glance. I mean, we've come a long, long way, folks. But there's one last change. I'm calling it the icing on the cake. It's, it's, it's the cherry on the sundae. And I know all of you, when I say we've got one last change, are cringing. Oh, no, 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 no mas. No, it's one last change. We are calling ourselves Horizon Financial. It is a new logo, a new name, but it's the same caring, engaged firm taking care of your family and ours for generations. And that's, that's what it is. It, it really is a family business. And I want to make that point. You are our family. Our clients are our family. I mean, this is the way we've done it business forever. The clients come first. And I have surrounded myself with people who share that same exact value. And, and the fact is, we want to be here for your family for generations, but also ours. My son Michael's running this firm. I met Steve Blazik 27 years ago. I, now, every Blazik son has worked here. Two work here currently. Everyone has. I went to John's high school graduation. It's a family business. Tim Hammond. Tim is part of my family. Tim has been with me for 30 years, 25 at this business, and five before that. I mean, it, it's, it's a family atmosphere to take care of you and those you love. And I just want to go over, you know, our advisors. They carry the load. Tim is our lead advisor. Of course, there's me, there's Carrie, there's John, Amanda Haggerty, Don Quarta, my niece, talk about the family business, my niece Ava Bly, she's our newest associate advisor, and then Ken still takes care of his original 40 clients or so before he just primarily moved to money management. But we have a talented, talented deep bench of advisors. Now, I know a lot of you get nervous with the youth movement when you see young faces around the office. But here's the one thing that I want to promise you. You know, it's not because we want to go after young clients. It's not. I will tell you it's because we want to have this firm last for you for a long time. And, and I will tell you, I don't know if it's because I was so close to my grandfather as a child growing up or my father was my best friend in, 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 in his later years. I've always felt more comfortable and a deep respect for people older than I was. And I'll tell you what, you know, your parents made this country safe. The my bulk of my clients made this country prosperous. We walked on your backs, and it's an honor to manage your money. But you know what the greatest honor is? Being here to manage your kids and your grandkids' money. Your needs are not being pushed to the side. Your needs are paramount. We just have to change a little bit and update to make sure their needs are met as well. That's really what's happening here. So we've put a firm together that I believe is built to last with in-house institutional money management. You're going to see that talent in just a minute. With personalized, comprehensive advice delivered by top advisors and the greatest clients who look to us anywhere money touches life. And I want to say this. Six weeks ago today, I was admitted to the hospital with COVID, and it was not good. Um, and there was a point in time where I had to sit in a room 
and they were deciding for five hours whether I was healthy enough to get the antibodies or just be admitted, and I was admitted at that time. And, you know, some crazy things go through your mind at that time, and you're thinking, huh, could this really be the end? Could this, out of nowhere, just feeling good a week ago, I could be checking out here? I mean, and, and I will tell you that, of course, you play your five hours in a room alone, you know how the hospitals can do that. You're sitting there and you're, you're thinking about everything, but I'll tell you this, guys, the thing that I was, one of the things I was extremely proud of was that all the employees here at the Horizon Group, all the clients we made the promises to, to take, get together, to take care of forever, Tim and that team of advisors, Ken and that team of money management, Mike directing the firm, we wouldn't miss a beat. We wouldn't, I hope I'd be missed, but we wouldn't miss a beat. You would be taken well care of. And so I just want to say thank you for everything. Uh, thanks for being clients. And wait till you see, really, uh, hopefully, the depth of what's being done with your money when Ken comes up here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. My sound okay, Mike? Beautiful. Thank you. I'm Ken Blazik, Chief Investment Officer here at Horizon Financial. What I want to do today is I want to take, I want to take the politics, the news headlines, the, the financial jargon, and just put it to the side. I just want to have a conversation and talk about what we own and why we own it inside of our portfolios. But in order to do that, I need to get you to think of portfolios the way we, on the Investment Policy Committee, think of portfolios. And the first step in that is I genuinely need you to kind of sit back, take a little bit of a breath, and let the noise go. All right? Relax. When you think of a portfolio, I want you to think of it like a puzzle. When you put a puzzle together, you fit all of the different pieces together to make a picture. With a portfolio, we put all the different investments together to make your portfolio, but in both cases, the key is making sure that those pieces fit together correctly so that you get the portfolio or the picture you set out to build. And the first step in building a portfolio, just like with a puzzle, is to organize your pieces, or in our case, investments. And we start by organizing our investments into two different buckets. We take all of those investments that are geared towards growth and we put them in something we call the growth bucket. Then we take all of the investments that are geared towards relative stability, and we put them in what we call the relative stability bucket. Once we have our pieces in their respective buckets or investments in their respective buckets, we can begin the process of putting together a portfolio. And I want to start with the growth side of things. And then on the growth side, typically we find stock-like investments. And I want to recap what a stock is. This is important. A stock is an ownership stake in a company. When you buy a stock, you buy an ownership stake in that company. And you do it so that you can benefit from the profits of that company, just like the owner of any company. With stocks, though, those profits come back to you in the form of either dividends or capital gains. Sometimes you do get both. And stocks come in essentially two different categories or two different classes, value and growth. And on this slide, I have the, the sort of technical um, characteristics. But when I say value, I just want you to think of a penny. A penny is worth one cent. But if a penny that was made before 1982 actually contains 1.7 cents worth of copper. That is a value investment. You can buy 1.7 cents worth of copper for one cent. Paying less than something is worth is a value investment. And when I say growth, I want you to think of the painting Sunflowers by Van Gogh. Van Gogh sold his painting Sunflowers to his brother Theo in 1890 for 50 bucks. It sold at a Christie's auction in 1987 for just over 40 million. That's a growth investment. You bought something that was worth 50 bucks, you held on to it over time, it grew in value exponentially, and you sold it for over 40 million. Whether it's value or growth, they all come in three sizes. And for all intents and purposes, it's just small, medium, and large. Once you got your pieces or investments organized, 
we can begin the process of actually putting them together. Before I get to there, I want to touch on this disclaimer. You're more than welcome to read it. But the reason for this disclaimer is I'm about to get into very specific examples. And as I go through these examples, I need you to keep in mind the fact that everybody's situation is a little bit different. So everything I'm talking about is relevant to everybody, but you could have a slight variation, and I just want to make sure that you know that. So let's start putting it together. We start in the large value slice. In our large value slice, we actually have two investments. We have First Trust Rising Dividend Achievers and First Trust Value Line Dividend. Now these are both large value funds. They both invest from the value standpoint, think of our penny, they're looking to buy things for less than they're worth, and they're buying large companies. But they're not the same thing. They do things differently. First Trust Rising Dividend Achievers in their selection process, they put an emphasis on low debt. By putting that emphasis on low debt, their largest exposures are to financial sector and the technology sector. But because we're putting pieces together, we need to go a little bit deeper. Because when you look inside the financials, you find it's not just banks. This fund invest, does invest in the big banks, like JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley, but it also invests in asset managers, like the Hartford like Fidelity. They also invest in insurance companies like Allstate and MetLife. And that, over, that, that large exposure to technology is not your typical technology names that you see on CNBC. This isn't your Amazons. What I'm talking about in technology, I'm talking about companies like HP, Hewlett Packard. I'm talking about companies like Texas Instruments, who makes all of the um, calculators. These are massive companies that are very profitable in the technology sector but they're not the, the high-flying growth names you see on CNBC. And we take that, that fund and we combine it with the First Trust Value Line Dividend. The First Trust Value Line Dividend has an emphasis in their selection process on low volatility stocks. And because of the low volatility component, their largest exposures are to companies in the defensive sector, companies like Walmart and Campbell Soup. And, and in the industrial sector, with companies like waste management and utilities like Con Ed. And you can see when we start putting these things together, we're taking the defensive, the industrials, and the, and the utilities from the first trust value line dividend, we're combining that with the rising dividend achievers where we have those financials and those technology companies. You're starting to see how we're putting these things together. And folks, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is not accidental. All of the math, all of the research, all of that stuff, we, we do all of that so that we can do this with precision. Execution of this is, can get complicated, but the theory is simple. We're just putting the pieces of the puzzle together. When we move from large value over to large growth, again, we're still talking about those large companies, but now we're looking at them from a growth standpoint. Remember our sunflower painting. When I say large growth, generally speaking, people do think of those Amazon and uh, Microsoft type companies, those large tech growth names. And we have a fund in the portfolio called Lord Abbott Growth Leaders. This fund is your typical large growth fund. They're trying to buy the fastest growing companies they can find. And this is where we find the, the um, holdings like Microsoft, like um, Amazon, and all of those high tech names that you hear about. But we also have the communication services which a lot of those names are the um, social media stuff. Where you, the, here we have this fund invest in companies like Facebook and Snapchat. And we take that, that high tech, that high growth name, and we combine it with Eaton Vance, Atlanta Capital Select Equity. This fund is also searching for those growth names, but they're not doing it absent price. In their process, they look at how much growth they're getting compared to how much the cost is. And because of that piece of their selection process, instead of just having those, those um, high growth tech names, we end up with, they end up holding companies like Thermo Fisher in the healthcare sector. And we get exposure to cyclicals like TJ Maxx and O'Reilly Auto Parts. They're both growth funds, both large growth funds, but they do things differently. Again, you're seeing this reoccurring theme of the way these puzzle pieces or these investments fit together. And now we've, we've handled the large cap space, we need to move down. Now we're in the mid and small cap space. 
And in the mid-cap space, we start with J.P. Morgan Mid-Cap Value Fund. This fund, when I talk about it, you just need to think of Warren Buffett. John Simon, the gentleman who runs this fund, has the same mandate. He is looking for good companies at a good price. And what does that really look like? I'll, I'll tell you about one of the holdings. It's M&T Bank. M&T Bank, a good company, good price. Is it a good company? M&T Bank is a regional bank with deep community ties. And they've also turned a profit every quarter since 1976, including during the financial crisis. That's a good company. And at a good price, it's currently trading roughly 20% below where it was prior to the pandemic. It's a good company at a good price. And we fit that nicely with the First Trust SMIDCAP rising dividend achievers. SMIDCAP is literally just mixing the words uh, small and mid together to make one word. And you, you should recognize the name, rising dividend achievers. It's the same selection process that we had in the large value space. But because we're now in the small and mid cap space, that selection process gets us a little bit of a broader diversification. And we see companies like Dick's Sporting Goods, Rena Center, William Sonoma. We're mixing that with those high conviction stories like I just told you in the M&T Bank. And that handles the, the mid and small cap space, but now we gotta move over to the international investments. On our international slice, we put together three different investments. Here you find Fidelity International Index, which when you look at the characteristics is really just a value fund, which is great because being an index, we get very inexpensive exposure to the value parts of the international markets. In this case, it gives us exposure to the European developed as well as Japan. Now those, those larger exposures to Japan, I'm just talking about the firm investing company, or the fund investing companies like um, Toyota. And in European developed, they invest in companies like AstraZeneca and Nestle. We fit that together with MFS international growth. So we're still looking at the international markets, but we're doing it from the growth instead of value side. Because of that little tilt, we still have the European exposure, but instead of the AstraZenecas and Nestle's, we have Roche, which in, in the healthcare sector. And instead of Japan, we have other Asian developed countries. And think of semi, um, Taiwan Semiconductor. And the third piece of, of this individual slice is the BlackRock Emerging Markets Fund. And when I say emerging markets, people generally just think of China. And yes, we do have exposure to the um, emerging Asian countries, but it's not just China. Think of Thailand, India, South Korea, where this, this fund has investments in companies like Samsung. But it's not just Asia either. Here's where we find exposure to countries like Brazil and Mexico. Putting them together to make that international slice. And then the last piece of the growth um, bucket is commodities. The first thing you should notice here is that there are no statistics. There is no data on that chart. That's intentional. A lot of times with commodities, you, with commodity funds, they don't invest directly or get direct exposure to the hard assets. They own the companies that do those things. So they, uh, instead of having direct exposure to gold, they own a company who mines for gold. Instead of having direct exposure to oil, they own a company that drills for oil. We go one step further, and with First Trust Alternative Absolute Return Strategy, we get the exposure directly to the hard assets, which we want. Because remember, we're putting together that puzzle. So we have exposure to physical gold, to physical copper, to physical oil, to the actual corn. We have exposure to those actual hard assets. And then we combine them all into your growth bucket. When we combine them all, what does it look like? Collectively, it's very well balanced between value and growth. Collectively, valuations are below that that Mark showed you in the market. We're still well diversified across sectors and geographic re regions. I don't know if you fell asleep during Mark's presentation, but he talked about all the uncertainty and stuff like that that is out there. And through the research and the history, we believe the best strategy is to remain balanced in that situation. But we're not done. We still have to put together our relative stability bucket which generally is made up of bond-like investments. 
and I want to review what a bond is and how it works. A bond is just like a loan. You buy a bond for 100 bucks, it's just like lending $100. And then you receive your interest payments, and at the end, or at maturity, you get your $100 back. With bonds, we can never not talk about the bond interest, um, the bond teeter-totter with interest rates and prices because they have an inverse relationship. As bond prices go up, interest rates go down and vice versa. This is how the Federal Reserve is able to keep interest rates down. They currently are buying $120 billion a month of bonds, so when they show up to buy $120 billion worth of bonds, it pushes those prices up and it keeps those interest rates low. But not all bonds are created equal. Remember, the, further you are, the farther you are away from the fulcrum, the more sensitive you are to changes in interest rates. Sitting on that fulcrum, you find your money market accounts. As interest rates move, your money market account stays where it is. It's very, very stable. But the further you move out, the more, like I said, the more sensitive you get to interest rates, but you also get paid a higher interest rate to take on that additional risk. And we have a way of measuring how far you are from that fulcrum and it's called duration. And duration has numbers just like the numbers you see on bonds. But, you know, 10 year bond, 10 year treasury. You can have duration 0, 1, 2, 10, 20, 30, just like you see in bonds. But it's nothing more than the measurement of how far you are from that fulcrum. And that, that duration calculation becomes very important when we start piecing together the uh, investments from the relative stability side. And I want to start with the piece that we call short duration. Short duration just means well, like it sounds. We're very close to the fulcrum with these two investments. They make up that short duration slice. But they don't, again, don't do the same thing. We have Eaton Vance short duration government, and we combine that with Putnam ultra short duration income. They're very similar in a lot of ways, except for the fact that in the Eaton Vance short duration government, we, have, we're, we own the debt or the the fund invests in the debt of government-backed entities. Think of the National Mortgage Association who buys mortgages from banks. And then there's Putnam Ultra Short Duration where, again, remaining short duration and all of that, but they invest in corporates. So through this fund, we have exposure to the debt of companies like L3 Harris, Bank of America, American Express. The, the debt of companies that most of us have heard of, they're just very short duration, very close to that fulcrum. But, then we, but we combine that slice with our intermediate core slash multi-sector slice. Here's where we start taking on a little bit of risk and moving a little bit further away from that fulcrum. Here we have John Hancock Bond Fund, which is designed to have the same characteristics as the bond index. So, so similar duration, similar distance from the fulcrum, similar credit quality, similar interest rates. The difference here is that we have a selection component. In an environment where we could experience rising interest rates, we don't want to just own the whole index blindly. We want to make sure that we're picking and choosing sort of the things that we own. And we combine that with the PIMCO Income Fund, which from a data standpoint certainly looks like an anomaly. It's got that duration of 1.8, which would indicate it's very close to the fulcrum, but it's getting paid with that interest rate like it's further out. The reason for that seems like an anomaly, but the reason for that is very specifically Dan Iveson, the gentleman who runs the fund. I've worked with Dan for over 10 years, and Dan has worked with this firm for multiple decades. But the way he does it is through some derivatives and some of the esoteric things that PIMCO, being the largest, one of the largest bond managers in the world, is able to do. But we are very comfortable with what Dan does and how he does it and the amount of risk he takes on. Again, in the context of the overall puzzle, we like the way it fits. And we have to move on to what I consider a little bit of a protection piece to, the, to our stability slice. And it's a combination where we combine our TIPS fund with international um, bonds. When I say TIPS, it's just an acronym. Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. And we do this with American funds, but that's what they own in there is TIPS. Treasury Inflation Treasury Inflation Protected Securities works exactly like normal bonds with a little bit of a caveat for inflation. So in a normal bond, I give you 100 bucks, I get my interest back, and then at the end, I get my $100 back. With an inflation-protected security, I, at the end, I get my $100 plus inflation. 
So in a terrible example, but one that, act, that does demonstrate the point, if I bought a one-year tip for $100, I would give the 100 bucks, I would get my interest payment, and then at the end, instead of just getting my $100 back, and let's say over that year inflation was 3%, instead of just getting my $100 back, I get $103 back to compensate me for that inflation. And we combine that with the Janice Henderson Global Bond Fund, because here's where we have, we have exposure to the debt of countries other than the US and it's denominated in currencies other than the US dollar. This is how we protect against the falling dollar in the, the relative stability bucket. When I combine that bucket together, the picture looks like this. In a relative stability bucket, we are shorter in duration, collectively, it's a shorter duration than the general market. We're well diversified across all sectors. We have high credit quality exposure, and we're well diversified across geographic regions with specific hedging against the possibility of inflation. Now, ultimately, we have to combine them both into your portfolio. And what does that look like? Actually, you kind of tell me. Your individual portfolio is dictated by your individual circumstances. This is why Mark and everybody else, myself included, who is the head of money management, talks about your relationship with your advisor. You and your advisor determine the ratio. You basically, your advisor tells us what picture to paint through, their, through your prior experiences, through your needs, your preferences, your income desires. What your life is dictates how we put these things together. And that's the important part, is putting the pieces together, but funneling it through your advisor so that we get the proper picture to meet your needs in your situation. And with that, I want to bring Mark back up. I'm right, Mark. Hey, thank you, Ken. I really do want to thank Ken for all he does. And I just want to come up and end this by being very, very clear. The reason we're leaving this slide up, I'm going to say it a different way. What Ken's job is and what the Investment Policy Committee's job is, is to make sure these two buckets are separate and that he's going to give you, and I think you got a great glimpse into what he just does, those six things that make, and the money market, that make up that relative stability, that his job and that team's job is to make the best relative stability bucket that they can. Their job also is to make the best long-term growth bucket. All of those investments he explained and how they fit together just so well and make sure that that's the very best. So the bottom line is this, their, that's, their, that's, that's where their responsibility ends. Your advisor and you determine the ratio between those two. And I was gonna say, I hope you appreciate now that you really see what we've done from a money management standpoint, what we've done from an advisement standpoint. We have an in-house institutional money management. I think you can see your money is being managed like a pension fund or an endowment with that kind of seriousness, with that kind of mathematical aptitude. I'm telling you, I am so proud of what Ken's put together. And here's what I'm proud of. At any other firm, this is where it ends. You go to a Morgan Stanley, you go to a, you, you go to a Merrill, guess what? Great, here's your portfolio, give us 1%. But it's only the beginning here because now we tailor it to your needs and we give personalized comprehensive advice anywhere touches life by top advisors. And I'll tell you, that's worth a fortune. That is where the war is won. I'm not minimizing what Ken does because it is a fantastic job, but I'll tell you what, when you combine that with monitoring your taxes and staying in touch and on top of your situation and giving advice about gifting or buying a second home or should I lease or buy the car, we want you to turn to us because you are great clients. And all I can say is, I'm going to end it with this, thank you. From the bottom of all of our hearts, thank you.